Yat e sheke doshe dana e she natani no te yeneshe. Hello, everybody. Uh, I really appreciate all of you guys coming out and showing your support uh, for this artist talk. Um, thank you to 108 Contemporary for this opportunity to exhibit the work alongside uh, Kite, who is an artist that I also deeply admire. Um, I also wanted to thank the sponsors, Robin Ballinger and Tulsa Artist Fellowship, which made this possible. And again, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to come and uh, hear me talk a bit more about the work in general and then specifically get into certain pieces that I want to focus on today. Um, so with the thank yous out of the way, um, I also wanted to mention kind of an outline for today's talk. Um, I'm going to read the statement that accompanies this work and then I'm going to invite everybody to walk around with me and we're going to look at um, about four different pieces that um, I think are some of my favorites and also relate to these larger conversations. And please bear with me, I'm going to have my notes, I'm going to be um, inviting people if you want to talk or uh, interrupt me in the middle of, <laughs> of talking to ask questions, feel free to do that. I'm hoping that this format will encourage participation and or even towards the end of the, the talk, um, allow you to feel comfortable to comment or ask questions. Um, okay, so, so with that kind of out of the way, I'm going to talk about the work in general. Um, so this show, um, I have 12 different works, they're all new. There are six uh, collaged mixed media works on paper and then six soft sculptures. Um, they relate to each other, um, but there are some kind of departures as well. Um, this new work explores connections between bodies, objects, and landforms. Central to the work is the concept of harmony and important questions surrounding contemporary existence and legality. How do we find beauty or balance in a chaotic and often violent world? What kinds of attacks are being wagered and how do we survive them? The series of mixed media drawings collage fragments together to provide space for alternative bodies and thoughts to exist simultaneously. Familiar and unfamiliar figures float, reach, and walk towards something or someone else. In a similar vein, these sculptures reference abstract limbs that are both human and non-human. Each piece is adorned with brightly beaded patches that look like freckles and tumors, while tufts of artificial fur allude to mammals or new life forms. In all, these works attempt to highlight where history, politics, land, and human rights converge. Which also brings me to my research interests in general. Um, I'm invested in native feminisms and conversations about intersectionality, and asking the question, what does that look like on a personal level, followed by a community level? And how does that contribute to ensuring a sustainable and equitable future for all people? All right, so I invite all of you to come with me and we're gonna talk about this first piece over here in the corner. This piece uh, is titled Justice Four, and it was one of the first collages in this kind of body of work that I made. Um, when I went into the studio, I was just ha trying to take the opportunity to have a stream of consciousness, kind of play with abstraction, color, and form, and not think too much about the concept. Um, however, the more I added to it, I started realizing that there was this uh, thing that was happening. Um, in the center, you see what I was referencing is kind of the, the hands of justice and um, this idea of balance and weighing what's between what's right and wrong. Um, these figures started to emerge, which to me, um, I was thinking about like dead birds or um, something that was hanging, so like a person that was hanging. Um, I'm gonna call attention to this part right here, um, Justice for MMIW2S, Girls and Men. So that acronym stands for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Two Spirits, and then adding girls and men. And over the years, it's like this idea of adding on to that acronym, and I am invested in talking about that as an issue within our community, but also I'm interested in solutions and problem solving. And so whenever I think of these kinds of things, I'm also thinking about who they affect and who we need to be part of the conversation in order to um, have real change take place. And I think that um, including everybody uh, is, is the only way that we can get to there. Um, some of the other uh, symbols that um, you may or may not pick up on um, in this like left corner are these little circles and I was thinking of these uh, black pebble rocks that were 
back on my family's land. I used to pick those up and play in the canals and we'd skip rocks. And so it's a very early memory. Uh, but then thinking about that accumulation um, of a, and repetition of, a, of an object or a shape and how that can start to stand in for other things. So for me too, I was thinking about the accumulation or populations of bodies. And so this mound started to then take on like other associations. I was thinking of like burial mounds, but I was also thinking about a mountain, this kind of idea of it of being a mountain um, that we need to kind of overcome. And then you have this hatch marking at the bottom. I was thinking of body count, but I was also thinking about uh, an old movie that I saw. I think it was called The Count of Monte Cristo or something, and he was in jail, and he was uh, making these hatch marks on the wall as kind of a, a way to mark the day, to remember the day. And as a young kid, that just stuck with me, this idea of him kind of being incarcerated and uh, trying to remember the days in that capacity. So. Um, there are other things that are in this piece as well, uh, but those were the key, key symbols and ideas that I was thinking about when I was making it. Um, and then the title, kind of this justice for, is kind of a call, a call out, and um, you fill in the blank. Like, who, who are we um, demanding justice for? And um, I, think I'll, I think I'll leave that there. Uh, the next piece, speaking of kind of legality and um, conversations surrounding human rights. I want to now talk about this piece behind you, uh, which is titled Jane Roe. I made this uh, sculpture soon after uh, Roe versus Wade was overturned and abortion became illegal in Oklahoma, along with many other states across the country. Um, I thought about not only my reproductive rights and health, um, but also how this reversal will disproportionately impact women of color and the economically disadvantaged. Which brings me to the question I posed earlier on, which is what kinds of attacks are being wagered and how do we survive them? I was also thinking about this form being like an arm stretching up, uh, maybe in pain, maybe in protection, maybe in protest. Uh, to me, it, is, it also looked kind of like a strange, like avant-garde handbag um, that has no actual function and or I was thinking about it as a vessel um, reminding me of like a, a half of like a Navajo wedding vase and um, a belly or a torso as well. So as you can see, and similar to the collage piece I first talked about, one thing can kind of stand for multiple things. And I really like that idea of one form um, or one reference actually being connected to a bunch of other different references. And um, I think the, the last thing that I would say about this one is that uh, I wanted to put it into the center of the room. Um, in this entire exhibition, I was thinking about the soft sculptures in relation to um, the collage works on the wall, and then thinking about the natural light that was coming in, but also moments where um, you could stand next to a sculpture and kind of see the collage in your periphery and start to recognize this repetition of shape and form. So with this arm that I was talking about over here, there are these arms that are extending in this piece over here and that also reference the same color palette. And so I like that idea of like story building starting to take place, like outside of me as the artist, outside of um, the installation, but as a visitor coming to the gallery and taking it all in. You might not know exactly what you're looking at, but in context or in reference to other things, you can develop your own kind of sense of, of what it is or hopefully leave with questions and um, not have the answers to those questions. All right, so uh, the next piece I wanted to talk about is over there in that corner. Um, I first started with this figure here, which is actually a moccasin with like a white leather legging, and then it's connected to this like fishnet leg. Um, I was thinking about this being one body, but this idea of kind of being connected to home, being connected to culture and tradition, but then having moments where you're connected to these other personas or um, contemporary, uh, like in this case, contemporary fashion or um, conversations about sexuality because fishnets and opacity seem to be sexualized in our society. 
And then the absurdity. So I was also thinking about that movie, A Christmas Story, and how the father gets sent um, that uh, leg lamp and that his wife is so horrified when she puts that leg lamp in the, <laughs> in the, in the front of the house so that everybody in the neighborhood could see it through the window. And so that's where this, I think, window started to pop up. But um, so that, that I found that as, as a child kind of uncomfortable, but kind of funny. And then as I got older and saw that movie again, um, I found it funny. And then now I think I'm still trying to unpack what that actually, <laughs> what that actually means for me. But um, I like when these like subtle references uh, that are pop culture and kind of universal or um, maybe not universal, but uh, uh, guess people from different cultures and different backgrounds and different generations can start to tap into those things and, and make other story build and make other um, stories from that. So um, I guess the, the next thing I wanna say about this is adding on to that idea of humor or absurdity being a tool within all of these works. Um, here it says for sale, Roma tomatoes, and we have these like little uh, circles, ovals that are on the ground and they've been pierced, two of them have been pierced. And I was thinking about um, fruit off the side of the road and either you know picking up that fruit, going and buying that fruit, um, but also kind of commerce and kind of exploitation too. Or where does that start to disintegrate or start to become um, corrupted as well? And I also think it's just kind of weird and kind of funny. Uh, this idea of these giant signs being attached to these really small little um, tomatoes that then start to me looks like um, pebbles on a sidewalk too and or droplets of blood or you know all these other things can kind of start to come into play. Um, and I guess the last thing about this I'll say is that there's this like vent up in the corner too. Um, and I think in quite a few of the pieces, there's always, there's like something like a portal or a, uh, an entry and exit point. And I'm really fascinated with that. Um, I don't have too much to say more than, than the fact that I think I'm constantly trying to, even with these uh, sculptures that are seemingly fixed, I'm, I'm trying to give them this opportunity to breathe and exist, but have entry and exit points so that they're not stuck. They're kind of living and breathing and they have um, agency. And so I'm always thinking of like these exit routes. And I, I think that's a result too of kind of the current state of the world, kind of thinking about mass shootings and um, acts of violence and being in situations where at any point you might have to flee or you might have to, to get to safety. Um, and so I'm still developing some of the language for this work. Again, it's very new. Um, work and I'm probably going to be exploring this for years to come. And the last piece that I'm going to talk about before I open it up for conversation or comment is uh, behind us and it's uh, titled Pinky in the Brain. Growing up I remember watching the cartoon Pinky in the Brain after school and I'd sing the theme song all the way through and I was amused at these mice and their plots to take over the world. So if you're not familiar with the cartoon, these mice are constantly trying to take over the world. Um, I'm gonna read some lyrics from that theme song so you know what I'm talking about. I'm not gonna sing it, but I will, <laughs> I will read it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so they're Pinky and the Brain. Yes, Pinky and the Brain. Their Twilight campaign is easy to explain. To prove their mousy worth, They'll overthrow the earth. They're dinky, they're pinky, and the brain, 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 brain. And it ends with the word narf, which I think is also very funny. Um, so although it's a silly reference uh, to begin with, and something I didn't really think about as a kid, but as an adult and as an artist now, you know, I'm interested in analyzing the powers at play in general in society. And so these questions came up for me, you know, what does taking over the world mean? if you come from a marginalized group or community? Um, what, uh, or how, how, how do mentalities like that, um, like let, and those levels of greed, um, how have those contributed to the colonization of the Americas? And how does lusting for power benefit anyone? Uh, what are the costs associated with it? 
And um, you know, so I don't have any clear, clear answers to those questions. Um, but I, I, I do like to think about that and how some of those things early on and through life, they kind of accumulate and stack and layer on top of each other and contribute to, to you as an adult and who you are and how you walk through the world. Um, what I like about this piece too, and I guess subconsciously what I was referencing as well is, um, is raised Iroquois beadwork. And I, I love, I'm nowhere near that level of beadwork, but I really appreciate it and it inspires me to look at some of those old pieces where, um, where people have beaded to the point where it's become sculptural. And I really love that and wanted to kind of incorporate that in this piece. And I was also thinking about it being like a weird interpretation of the game Cat's Cradle. And so you have these kinds of um, lines that are going back and forth, and so these are connected. Um, and so I was thinking about that game and how strings are connected between your hands um, and, and how that could also, again, reference this idea of power at play and um, who's kind of in the position of power, who's going to win, who's not going to win. Um, and again, like that play on words. So we have the cat's cradle, but then the original reference was these mice. So this kind of cat and mouse game and how that could be a stand-in for, I think, society in general. So I think, I think that's it. <laughs>